Education Director for the DPC Ed Center. And I think we'll go ahead and get started with our October educational webinar. Uh, today I'm excited to say that we're going to learn about grocery shopping. Um, is it safe or scary for the renal diet? And it's hard to make the best choices at grocery stores. I think that's whether you have, um, if you are living with kidney disease or not. And so today we're going to learn how to navigate the grocery store successfully. Our speaker today is Jessie Anna Seville. She's a registered dietitian. She's licensed in the state of Texas. And she works with people with kidney disease, both in dialysis and as a private nutrition therapist. She provides private nutrition counseling for CKD, for diabetes, and for food sensitivities. She blogs about kidney disease at her website, kidneygrub.com. And as a can-do dietitian of the renal diet, she's very passionate about nutritious, kidney-friendly food can help people feel their best. She believes that no matter the dietary restriction, kidney-friendly food should look great and taste great. And perhaps you've had a chance to try some of her recipes. She contributes a monthly recipe to our Ed Center website, and so I encourage you to also check that out. And at this point, I'd like to turn the program over to uh, Jessiana. Uh, just you will be muted during the program. You can chat and send a message or a question if you like online or uh, at the end of the program. We will have time for question and answers and you can unmute your phone by doing star six at that, at, at that point and you can mute your phone again by doing, or by doing count six and you mute your phone by doing star six. Okay, Jessiana. Okay, so, so Christy would do that for you. Sure, Christy. Okay, thank you, Christy. Um, anyways, I'm really happy to be here today and talk about grocery shopping for the renal diet. Um, for this, the month of October, we entitled it Safe or Scary. Uh, I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old, and so right now, grocery shopping for me is primarily scary. Like, I feel like I, when I, like, get to the cash, cash register to check out that I've, like, crossed the finish line. Um, but that's for entirely different reasons than, than uh, other people that are following dietary restrictions. I'm hoping today that I can really give you some great uh, tips and a little bit of guidance as far as uh, grocery shopping, especially label reading. Um, this, uh, this can be a, a really, really broad topic, so I tried to hone in on a couple specific products, a couple specific areas um, to talk about today. Um, I just want to make a couple comments. A lot of the food pictures that I've added are from my blog. This was last year we did a, a Halloween post um, on this, this first slide. Uh, but let's go on to the, to the second slide. So there's a few common grocery store myths that I'm hoping that I can debunk today. Um, because really understanding how to make these work makes it a lot easier to, to grocery shop. So the first thing that you hear all the time is that eating healthy is too expensive. Um, and while I agree that there are some very, very expensive healthy foods, really you can eat healthy and it doesn't have to break the bank. Um, this little graphic I put on here is from the My Plate. Um, and they were talking about how much you can buy for $10. If you buy everything fresh, you can get around 15 portions of fresh fruits, fresh vegetables um, for less than 10 bucks. If you mix it up a little bit with canned, a little bit of frozen, a little bit of fresh, then you can get 18. Um, and um, there is definitely a place for canned and frozen. You don't have to always buy fresh, and we're going to talk how you can do that. But uh, you can definitely buy fruits and vegetables and healthy foods, and if you're watching the sales, um, then it, it doesn't have to break the bank. and can even save you money. Um, so that second thing, fruits and vegetables are too expensive to buy. Again, some of the reason for that is people find that they go to waste. So I'm hoping I can talk about ways that you won't have to have those go to waste. Another common grocery store myth is that you should always shop the perimeter. Like that's where all the healthy foods are. Um, and while there are plenty of healthy foods on the perimeter um, of the grocery store, and that's usually talking about the fruits and vegetables, and then the meat department, and then the dairy, um, this, this is not 
uh, this is not necessarily true. There's plenty of healthy options in the middle aisles as well. Um, two other common myths, and we're going to get into this when we talk a little bit more about how food marketing is done, but is that organic is healthiest, and that when you see natural on the label, that that's also healthy. And both of those things are also myths. Um, they can be healthy, um, and there is definitely a large portion of those that are great choices, um, but those aren't necessarily the only healthy foods or even the healthiest foods. Uh, so going on to the next slide. Um, I, I, did, I love this picture because it gives this broad expanse of these thousands and thousands of products that are at the grocery store. Um, and this really is where, like, any dietary challenge starts is by what you put in your cart and buy and take home. Uh, going on to the next, this just a few, a little bit of data about how bombarded we are with choices in the grocery store and why it can really get scary and overwhelming to shop, especially when you have some specific dietary parameters that you're, you're uh, looking at. So. Um, an average supermarket has around 45,000 SKUs, so that's like 45,000 different types of products. Super centers have on average 100,000. Think about how many choices that is. That blows my mind. Um, the average shopper buys 61 items in 26 minutes, unless you're me with two kids, and then it's, it's that, that doesn't even work. It's like 20 items in an hour and you have to put at least 70 items back. Um, so the average shopper looks at a product for 13 seconds and spends nine seconds on the final choosing. So we are really geared to uh, uh, read a label, be sold by the picture, the colors, the, the uh, big uh, keywords that they put on those labels to put it into our cart. Um, and there's a, a few ways we need to work around that when we're looking at food specific for the renal diet. Um, and then this last one, one half to two thirds of the decisions are made at the point of purchase. Um, so it, it just we make our decisions just right away on a lot of foods. Um, and backing up a little bit and knowing what you're looking for can really help slow that down and make some better choices. So moving on to the next slide, I have a couple pictures here of how a lot of people Still in the grocery store, we have the man in front of the salads, and there is rows and rows and rows of salads in the grocery store. I don't even know how there can be so many bag salads, but there, there certainly is an endless variety. Um, on the next, we have this man choosing meat. Again, we have, are we doing organic meat or grass-fed meat or, or the cheapest meat or the most expensive meat? There's a lot, a lot of choices um, that we encounter. And then this last one is often how some people feel um, when they're trying to navigate all these tags and choices and colors and words. Um, so that, that is definitely the reality of grocery shopping for us. Um, just to make a side note here, I spent a couple of years in Fiji. And Fiji is a third world country. Um, and when you go into a grocery store there, you have maybe three product choices per type of food. I mean, we have a whole aisle of cereal in America with, who knows, like 50 different cereals or more. There we'd have three. So after a couple of years of being in that type of environment and coming home, I would walk into the grocery stores or anywhere, even a mall, and I would be overwhelmed by the number of choices. I just couldn't believe we had so many options. Um, so being a, a smart shopper in America is key because we do have a lot of options and um, Food companies are, are very, they have got their marketing down to an art. And so they really, really know how to target people so that their products can get picked. So moving on to this next slide, talking about labels. Um, I pulled up this graphic because a lot of these pictures here are things that appeal to us when it comes to health. Um, so we see 100% natural. We see made with real honey, made with real fruit. Uh, we see that on fruit snacks all the time. Uh, Fat-free, sugar-free, whole grain, immune support, no nitrates, no nitrates, uh, heart healthy. So we'll just, there's always health messages that are on our food labels, um, except for Halloween candy. And they don't put health messages on that, just ghosts and skeletons. Um, so navigating this is, 
is really is really important. So I don't want to go through all the different labeling, but I want to highlight two labels that kind of are a good trigger to look a little bit deeper. Um, and the reason for these labels and knowing about them is because of phosphate additives. As most of you know, those phosphorus that are added into our foods um, are 100% absorbed. And so that can, that's something that if you're, if for anybody, it doesn't matter if you have stage three kidney failure or you're on dialysis, watching for phosphates in your food is huge in keeping your phosphorus down. And they're added in everything. It's everywhere. And we're going to see some, some real products in a minute. But there's two labels that can really help you kind of pick out a food quick that may not have phosphate additives. Um, and th the reason this is valuable is because, again, we have so many products. I was in the grocery store the other day, and I went through the whole case of refrigerated creamers, every single brand of creamer I looked at. So it's probably like 10 different brands of creamers because I was trying to find one without phosphate additives, and I couldn't find one. Um, so two things that can kind of shorten that search. One is looking for um, a natural label. And natural isn't necessarily a health term. This is very vague. Um, there's not a lot of regulation on what that means. But when you see something that says natural, no preservatives, often you can find that that does not have phosphate additives in it. Um, Organic can also be useful because that usually means that they won't have an enormous amount of additives, especially phosphate additives. So those are two terms that when you see them on a food product can kind of trigger you to, to look at it a little bit closer. There are natural, uh, there are products that don't have that label that won't have phosphate additives, but if you're really looking for, say, like um, a, uh, a deli meat, and you're looking for one without phosphate additives, looking for a natural or organic product can kind of help you get through that. Okay, so moving on to the next slide, talking about nutrition facts. And this first section, we're going to go over labels just a little bit, because this is, this is where you gain a lot of power over the marketing, is knowing the labels. Um, so a couple things that you really look at on the label if you have kidney disease, and then we're going to look at a label here in a minute. Serving size. You have to look at serving size and then ask yourself, is this how much I usually eat? Um, so if it's a can of soup and it says one cup, do you usually only eat one cup of soup? Or do you have a, a cereal bowl size and you're eating two cups of soup? That is going to make a difference on what those numbers mean afterwards. Um, sodium, of course, is a big one. Sodium is a required uh, nutrient to be labeled on nutrition facts, so you'll always find that. I like to look at calories. Um, I think that gives me a good perspective of how, uh, of, of what's in that food, so I'll, I'll check that out. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter. You can have a high calorie food, a low calorie food if you have kidney disease, but it, it gives you a good perspective of that food if it has a lot of fat or sugar or that sort of thing. I'll look at carbohydrates, um, sugar, Sugar content, I feel like, is an important thing. Some things can have a lot of added sugar. If you look at, like, Jif peanut butter, it has 42 grams of added sugar, which is insane. That's, a, that's quite a bit. Um, calcium, I will look at because that's something for kidney disease that can become a problem if people are eating a lot of calcium-fortified foods. Ideally, you'd want to have that less than 10%. Um, Sometimes you'll find potassium and sometimes you'll find phosphorus on the labels. Potassium is supposed to be required on labels by end of this, this year or sometime next year, but that keeps getting pushed back, so I'm not sure. If you see phosphorus on the label, it's always going to be in a percentage. So say like 10%. And you just add a zero and then you know how many milligrams. Um, so looking at a label here specifically. So um, there we have the serving sizes right at the top. Uh, looking at a one cup serving, if, if you say to yourself, and let's say this is for soup, um, you say, I usually eat two cups of soup at lunchtime, then you're going to know whatever is in here, we're going to double it as far as, as, far as the quantity. Um, and this looks a lot like a tomato soup type product. Um, 
Then you go down here and you can see where the sodium is. This has 660 milligrams of sodium. That's quite a bit. I mean, 28% of your daily value um, if you're counting on like a 2,000 milligram diet. So that's, that's a lot of sodium. Usually I say for like a meal item, if you're eating it as a whole meal, like a frozen meal, we aim for 500 to 700 milligrams. If it's something that you're gonna use as a side dish, um, you're going to try and get it lower than 200 and preferably lower than 100. Ingredients. Okay, and we're going to look at some ingredients here. This is the number one most important thing to gain power over the grocery store is starting to get familiar with ingredients. This is huge and, and in just telling you so, so much about the food. The ingredients is huge. They're tiny, it's hard to read sometimes. And really, this, when you start reading ingredients, it's a little bit of an investment up front as you start to get to know products and finding products. Um, so they list it by weight and quantity. So if you have something that says wheat, and then the next ingredient is corn syrup, and then the next ingredient is salt, there's, in that product, it's going to mostly be made of wheat, but salt is still quite a uh, still going to be using quite a high quantity as well. Um, the other thing that you will see on uh, the label or in the ingredients that will designate that there's salt is sodium and also monosodium glutamate, MSG. Sometimes they'll just abbreviate it. That is also a sign of salt. <clears throat> a big, big one is this PHOS, looking for FOS. Um, Anything with that PHOS, and I'm going to show you several great examples here in a minute, but when you see that FOS in the ingredients, it is an inorganic phosphate, and it's definitely something you're going to watch out for. The other thing you'll see a lot of is potassium chloride. Um, the reason I look out for this is sometimes when they're cutting back on salt in food, um, they will replace it with a potassium chloride, and that can it make the potassium content just go through the roof. Um, and again, I have an example of all these things in a minute. Um, when it comes to bread, cereal, tortillas, and meat, um, even, I mean, really almost anything, you have to look for those phosphate additives. You see them in beverages. Um, they are all over the place. The most unsuspecting places, you will find them. But canned meats, you see a lot. And then uh, grain products, you'll see them quite a bit as well. <clears throat> okay, so a couple labels here to give you an example. So these are common products that are generally considered okay on a kidney-friendly diet. You'll see them on lists. You can have syrup. You can have garlic. You can have Cheerios. And I wanted to point out that it's, while you can, knowing your brand is pretty important. So here we have Aunt Jemima uh, syrup, which is very common. Um, everyone loves Aunt Jemima because she's so happy when you have breakfast in the morning. But if you look closely at the ingredients down here, you can see that they use sodium hexametaphosphate as a preservative. Um, again, here is garlic, which is almost like the most benign product in the world. But this particular brand of garlic had garlic, water, and phosphoric acid. Um, so this one has added phosphorus. So if you're using this in cooking, you're cooking from fresh, doing you know, trying to stay healthy, you may be adding phosphorus to your food and not even realizing it. Um, and a lot of times all you have to do is switch brands and then you're done. Um, so, and then Cheerios is another one. Um, you see this tripotassium phosphate in it. I know uh, the Kashi Good Friends Cheerios, they do not have phosphate additives in them. Um, oftentimes the store brands will not have uh, the added phosphorus in them, so that's something to kind of look out for. But these are examples of why reading your ingredients is so, so powerful. Okay, so moving on down just a little bit into the produce department um, and what you'd find when you walk in into the grocery store. Um, I've done grocery store tours for a lot of my patients, usually if it's uh, if they are patients I'm seeing, they're not on dialysis yet, we'll have an initial consult, and then the second time that we meet, we meet at the grocery store, and we really find this helps solidify a lot of principles. Kind of walk through, look at how you pick things, um, 
because getting good produce really makes it easier to consume it. If you get something that is wilty or starting to, it's not at the peak of its freshness, just don't enjoy it as much. Um, so here we have her, she's picking out peppers, which of course are kidney friendly. Um, but I wanna talk about a few other produce items you can get. Um, the first great tip I have for you, and this is going on to the next slide, is especially when you're going the first couple times, is bring a list the first couple times. There are lots of grocery lists for dialysis patients that float out there. And I highly recommend you find one and you stick with one list. Don't have three or four lists and try and compare them and figure out which one has what, because sometimes they can conflict a little bit. Um, but just pick one list and stick with that list and use that list as your guide. Um, if you can bring that list your first time, you can look at fruits and say, apples are on right now, apples are in season, they are delicious. I think um, I was walking through the, the aisle the other day and even with uh, small children, madness, like the, the apples, the empire apples and the Portland apples that are out there, are so fragrant and just that rich fall flavor. Um, and they tasted just as good. But that's a kidney friendly food and it's right at the top. So if you have your list with you, um, you can you can pick that out. We have a list on my website. Um, if you're a dialysis patient, your dietitian will have lists. Um, you can also Google grocery list for dialysis, and a couple of the drug companies have had um, really beautiful lists compiled that you can print out and always have on hand. Um, but that's the first thing. When you go into the produce department, bring a list the first couple times so you start to get to know what foods you can have. Um, the second thing when you go into the produce department is check your circular ahead of time. One thing that is great about produce is often if it is featured in the circular at a lower price, it means that it's in season. Um, and so that's going to be some of your best produce, sometimes your cheapest produce. Every once in a while it's the stuff that's old and they're trying to get rid of, but a lot of times it's your most fresh, your, your produce that is, they just have a lot of it because it's in season, the farmers are producing a lot. Um, this is a Kroger uh, circular that I brought. I was highlighting, and this is actually from this week. Um, I, I wanted to highlight the grapes there, 88 cents a pound, which is a, a great deal. That's a kidney-friendly food that you could buy this week. Um, they have this Aldi's one. I wanted to point out the carrots here. They have the baby pack carrots, which were 50 cents per bag, which is so cheap. And it, it looks like the slide cut off a little bit, but they had apples at the bottom, which were like $1.29 a pound, which is a, which is a good deal. I generally, for myself, aim for my produce, preferably to be less than 99 cents a pound, um, but I'm willing to go as high as $1.50 if I need be. And on very special occasions, I'll get something a little bit more expensive. But you can usually find produce that's less than a dollar a pound, or at least less than $1.27 a pound. Um, and that's talking from Texas. So every place is just a little bit different. So the next thing, and this is kind of a really fun thing to do, there is a website um, called the Seasonal Food Guide, and there's several of these out there, but you can go in and you can type your state in or your area in, and it will give you a list of all the fruits and vegetables that are in season then. And that can be an excellent guide for you to know which ones are gonna be freshest, taste the best, and probably be at a much better price. Um, I just pulled up apples in Texas, and they are in season from June through November. So we have a couple, a few more weeks before apples go out of season and then we just have boring tasteless apples, but right now they are delicious. Um, so that, that's another great resource uh, for you in the produce department. Um, so without going into like tons of detail about high, low potassium fruits and vegetables, because that can be a whole lecture in and of itself, Commonly safe ones, apples, applesauce, berries, cherries, clementines, grapes, um, lemons, limes, pears, pineapple, plums. Those are very common fruits that you will see in the stores. Um, common ones that you should watch out for, and if you have them, keep, have a smaller portion are things like oranges and mangoes, cantaloupe, honeydew, kiwi, pomegranate. Those are all very high in potassium. But for some people, that's okay. They can have that extra potassium. Um, if these are some of your favorites, pomegranate is one of my personal favorites, but just keeping your portion size smaller is, is a wise thing to do. 
I think it's also sometimes fun, um, especially when you feel like your diet's very restricted, is to try a new fruit or vegetable. There's a lot of hybrid things that you'll see in the grocery store. Now, I brought two of these because um, I think they're so interesting. They have the, the grapele, which is like this grape apple hybrid. It's really actually pretty good. Um, and this time of year, and they're just about out of season, are the cotton candy grapes. And they really do taste like cotton candy. It kind of blows your mind. Um, but those are fun. Sometimes even just picking out a unusual food, um, looking on your list, and finding something you haven't tried before can help you feel like your diet's not so restricted. So this, this funny looking uh, strawberry thing with a white skin, that's called a, a lychee. I might have even said it wrong. Um, it's an Asian fruit. So something new that you can try in the grocery store. A couple others I put on here, passion fruit, fun to try, Asian pear, cotton candy grapes, the grapefruit. You can find different fruits or vegetables to try. Um, and as always, you can always ask your dietitian if you find something like, I don't really want to taste that. Um, you can buy it and have a smaller portion and ask her how much you can have of it. Um, a great way to expand your diet. So vegetables. Um, one of the biggest problems with vegetables is people do find they go to waste. So when you, when you are thinking about the vegetables that you're going to be buying at the grocery store, when you go in there, have a plan on what you're going to do. So look at your grocery list. Again, my number one thing is have that list. Have one list that you work off of and just highlight a couple that you want to try that week um, and that you're going to eat that week. So maybe you're going to have cabbage and you're going to steam it. So you're going to saute it. So that way you know I'm going to go in, I'm going to buy cabbage, and we're going to be having it Wednesday night. Um, so that's one of the best ways you can prevent waste and make sure that whatever vegetables you buy, that you use them up. Um, and have a plan on what you're going to do with them. Uh, so commonly safe ones that you'll see in the store, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, um, corn gets kind of a bad rap in the renal diet, but it's OK to have cucumbers, green beans, lettuce, okra, onions, peppers, radishes. So lots that you can do there. Um, almost all the salad vegetables, with the exception of tomatoes, are, are great vegetables to have for the renal diet. Um, ones to limit or watch out for, of course, that you'll see in the produce department are potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, the winter squashes that are out now, like the butternut squash, um, the delicata squash, the acorn squash. Um, those ones have a lot of potassium. So if you choose to use them, it's good to double boil them or keep your portion size small. So same thing as pumpkin. Uh, and tomato is probably one of the very most common ones. So, and again, trying something new can be really, really fun. Expand your palate. So rhubarb, bamboo shoot, bitter melon, which is such an interesting vegetable to me. I don't have an acquired taste for it yet, but I have tasted it. Um, and it's fun, but it really is bitter, and it has its place, but I didn't grow up with it. Um, rambutan is kind of a real interesting one. A little bit of bok choy added to your uh, stir fries can be great. Daikon, celery root. Um, those are some things that you can you can try. Uh, okay, so moving on to bread, tortillas, cereals, and side dishes. Um, and this is some of those middle aisles. You, there are healthy foods in the middle aisles and things you definitely would want to include. Um, the big thing with bread, tortillas, Cereals, and when I say sides, I mean like rice, pasta, uh, those type of, those type of uh, carbohydrate foods, is really, it comes down to phosphorus and sodium. Those are like the bad guys that can show up in these foods and, and really trick you. Um, phosphorus is big when it comes to cereals. Even tortillas, corn tortillas, are fantastic for the renal diet. Um, they're low in sodium. They're easy. Um, but some tortillas have phosphorus phosphorus added to them. Um, the white tortillas don't have phosphorus as much, but they have an enormous amount of sodium. Um, I've, I've been able to find corn tortillas, several brands at my stores that don't have phosphorus in them, so it just took me a few times of turning over the packages, reading through the ingredients a little bit to find a brand. And once you find a brand, you know that every time you go to the grocery store, you can, you can get that brand. So it's just the initial investment and getting to know what products are at your store. 
Um, another big thing with, uh, with these grain products is the fiber content. Um, looking for things that have extra fiber in them is really helpful. That usually shows that they have a, a more of a whole grain. Um, whole grains also get a bad rap in the renal diet, but they, um, you don't absorb all the phosphorus in a whole grain. So they're actually uh, generally recommended now. Um, and there's been several articles published on that recently. Um, so whole grains would be okay if you want to stick with a whole wheat bread rather than a white, that would be fine. Um, sometimes sugar content, potassium can be an issue if you're getting an alternative grain, um, like if you're looking at quinoa or uh, some of the interesting cereals that are out there. A lot of times they'll, they'll list potassium on those um, on, on those products, but if not, it'd be a good idea to check with your dietitian. You may not even have to worry about potassium in your diet and it wouldn't be a, an issue, but some of those alternative ancient grains that we see so popular right now have quite a bit of potassium. Um, so I wanted to do a quick comparison here of these two breads and just show you these labels. If we were in the grocery store, I would pull these off of the shelf and I would hand them to you and we would touch them and look at them and, and see what the labels are telling us about this product. Because again, the way that you master the grocery store is you get to know the labels. So here we have on the top, we have the Pepperidge Farm whole grain, 15 grain bread. So the first thing I did is I looked at the ingredients. Um, it has whole wheat flour, water, sugar, wheat gluten. So I read down this as carefully as I could. Um, and I didn't see any phosphorus additives. Um, I, I was kind of finishing up this presentation last night, uh, pretty late at night, and I was like, oh, I hope I don't pick one that accidentally has one. That looks like, looks like I scored. So this one does not have phosphate additives. If you look here at the nutrition facts, the serving size here is one slice, one slice of bread. So everything we read here is gonna be about that one slice of bread. The sodium content, is 115 milligrams, um, which is pretty reasonable for a slice of bread. If you can find one less than 100, that's fantastic. They're usually somewhere between 100 to, I've seen it as much as 225, 250 milligrams of sodium for a slice. Um, but this is for one slice of bread, 115, which is pretty good. Um, and then I also looked at the fiber here because I felt like that gave me a good perspective of how whole this food was as far as it being a whole grain, a more simple food. And I had three grams of fiber, which is great. That's, that's fantastic for, for a grain product. Um, and there's a little bonus, five grams of protein. So those whole grains have, have a good amount of protein in them as well. Um, okay, now we look here at the Wonder Bread, the iconic Wonder Bread of all ages. Um, if you look down here, this is kind of more towards the bottom, but it still exists. They do have a monocalcium phosphate on here. So that is a phosphate additive. Um, the serving size here is two slices. So, um, and the sodium, oh, my thing got up a little bit, was around 250 milligrams. So these actually are just about com comparable when it comes to sodium, because if we divide 250 in half, it's around 125. So per slice, they're almost the same, but if you look at fiber, less than one gram. So there's no fiber in this. It's a very, very processed food. Uh, going on to the next slide here about meat. This can be another confusing area in the grocery store. Um, I, so the other day I was, I was walking through, take a little step back, I was walking through the meat department and um, my little boy, he's about 15 months old and he gets so excited at the grocery store. So he gets out of the car and he runs over and he loves to press the squishy packages of the meat. And then he got a little bit ahead of me and he got to the eggs. And I know how I know that you know how this is going to end, but he opened up the carton of eggs and he grabbed one and he just like squeezed it between his hands. There was egg everywhere. It was it was a little bit of a disaster. But um, hopefully most of you don't have to to handle that as much. With the meat, what you're really looking for here is the phosphate additive. Sometimes sodium, phosphorus and sodium are two things that are injected into meat and they can look like fresh meat um, to, to make them moist and juicy um, when we cook them and eat them. Um, looking for fresh 
or natural on the label, when it comes to meat, these are good things to look for on your labels, can often indicate that there are less additives. Um, you may see that they'll say, um, and, and they have to put it on there. If they have injected it with any sort of a solution, then it will be on their label. I do find at our local grocery store that just our basic, uh, you know, yellow styrofoam package with the plastic over the top, just a very basic, almost the most, the cheapest chicken product is actually fine. They haven't injected anything into it. But some of the Tyson products or Butterball, um, some of those can have the additives in them. Here's another meat product that I wanted to point out. So we have here two, and these are at Walmart, two great value chunk chicken breast, canned chicken. So the top one is low sodium. So you think, oh, that's going to be a great choice for me. It's not going to have a lot of salt in it. The bottom one is their premium chunk chicken breast. So it's two of these here. Um, if you look at the ingredients first, you see that for the low sodium one, they have a quite an extensive list here, which includes potassium chloride, and it also includes sodium phosphate. Um, if you look here at the bottom one, it's just chicken breast, water, and salt. Um, so you can't quite see the side here. The difference in sodium between these two per portion is around uh, 90 milligrams. So the top one, the low sodium one, has 140 milligrams, and the bottom has 230. Um, the potassium is half with the bottom one because it doesn't have that potassium additive. Um, and we, can, we don't know how much phosphorus is in it, but that phosphate additive, again, something you readily absorb. I would generally recommend, even though the top one's low sodium, that people pick the bottom one and maybe rinse it off um, rather than the top one with the two additives in it. So that's a great example of a product um, that can be really tricky in the grocery store. If you're not looking at your label, if you're just sold by the front of the package, you won't always know what you're getting. And, and I mean, ingredients, that, that's your power as a consumer, is reading the ingredients. And they're required to put them on there um, for, that, for that very reason. Milk alternatives. This is another big question that comes up all the time. Um, you'll see milk alternatives. You'll see the shelf-stable ones a lot of times in the organic sections, and then you'll see them in the refrigerated section, I think probably in the last five to 10 years, this has just exploded as an industry, um, the different types of milk alternatives. This Ripple brand is a new one that's made from a uh, pea protein. Um, it's been quite heavily marketed. Um, and I wanted to pull this one up, especially because it, it's a great comparison to milk. Um, so when you're looking at milk alternatives, milk or the alternatives that they have out there, you are looking for phosphate additives. That can be very, very prevalent in milk alternatives, whether it's soy milk or cashew milk or any of those milks. Um, sodium can be an issue. It's generally not the biggest one. Uh, that's something to, to take into consideration. Potassium can be a huge issue in this. Um, and this is a great example here, this ripple milk. If you look closely at the picture, the potassium content is 450 milligrams. Um, so that's, that's quite a bit of potassium. In fact, that's, I think, almost more than a, a glass of milk itself. Um, so I, I would definitely check for the potassium. Soy milk is another one that is fairly comparable as far as uh, potassium in milk. If you don't have big problems with potassium, it may be a non-issue. But if you're struggling with that a little bit, that's something to, to take a closer look at. Soy milk is lower in phosphorus than regular milk, but potassium is almost the same. Um, both that isn't necessarily always better. So I was telling you about the creamers I looked at the other day. I went through the whole, the whole case of the creamers, the entire case of the creamers. And this is even an upscale, more upscale grocery store. I know there are some creamers that don't have phosphate additives. You will see it a lot of times in the low-fat creamers that they'll put those phosphate additives in them. Um, so low fat is not always better on your creamers. If you're just using a little bit to put in your coffee, um, then maybe just get a regular one or even get a, a real heavy whipping cream and then just use a, a teaspoon or two. You don't even have to use even a, as much of the product. Um, the other big thing that can be helpful is looking for unenriched. Uh, that's what you're going to look for on those milk products. 
unenriched, or sometimes they'll say original flavor. I think the rice milk there, original flavor is unenriched. Um, the reason to check for that is generally because of the calcium content. Um, if your calcium is running good with your labs every month, maybe a non-issue. If, however, your calcium, calcium is running a little bit elevated, it could very, be, very well be your milk alternative. A lot of times they put way more calcium in these than, than regular milk would have. Uh, so giving you this, here's an example of what I was just telling you about. Here's the original, a classic rice stream milk. Um, and if you look really close, it doesn't have any phosphate additives in it. It doesn't have any um, added potassium in it, low in sodium. This can be a really great choice. It doesn't taste the same as milk. It's great to make pancakes with or other products that you, you'd be using um, to make milk with. I know when we blog and we're using a... Um, we're needing to have like a milk product, a lot of times we'll use this um, to cut back on the potassium and phosphorus. Um, I think we have a recipe coming up soon where we made a, a Thai tea, and we used this as part of our kind of our more creamy base, and then we did some heavy whipping cream to kind of finish off and have a really, really good creamy product. Uh, last one, and I had to laugh at these pictures because this, I felt like it's so true when you look at convenience foods, and this has happened so many times. Like, you pull out the little pizza, and you're like, it's like they give you a piece of toast with some tomato sauce on it. It's, it's really funny to me. Um, so convenience and frozen foods. The big one there again, sodium. Sodium is a big one. If you're, And I'm going to show you a couple uh, meals here that some dietitians have shared with me. Um, generally, I say for people, if you're looking at products, you're going to aim for around... Uh, 500 to 700 milligrams of sodium. That, if that's all you're eating at that meal is that one package dinner, that's about what you, like a reasonable goal for a meal for your sodium intake is around 500 to 700 milligrams. Um, and then avoiding, obviously, the really cheesy products. I mean, this piece doesn't have any cheese on it, um, even though they say it does. But Avoiding really cheesy products can help cut back on the phosphorus. You will see phosphate additives in them sometimes, but not always. So again, and I know I sound like a broken record, but reading the ingredients there gives you the power to make a good choice. Um, and then last thing here, frozen veggies, frozen fruits. Those are actually okay and just fine to have. Um, the ones you don't want to get are the pre-seasoned ones because they're going to have a lot of salt. But even the steaming ones, they're convenient. If you're by yourself, you can eat a little bit, put it back in the freezer, and then you don't have a lot of food waste. Uh, frozen fruits are fantastic. Blueberries, raspberries, um, blackberries, you find strawberries, you find those all frozen. And those are another thing you can pull out, let them thaw a little bit. Um, and you ha put, them in a, um, put them in your cereal. I like to eat the frozen raspberries plain. Um, and it gives you a great snack, can quench your thirst, um, and you're not wasting anything because it can stay in your freezer for a long time. Okay, so a couple of meals I wanted to share with. These Smart Made, they're made by Smart Ones. They don't have phosphate additives in them. This particular one was an Asian-style garlic chicken. Um, sodium, 570 milligrams. So. That fits within that parameter for my meal of 500 to 700, even on the low side. Um, has four grams of fiber, which is pretty substantial, 21 grams of protein. So a really good choice here. And you can't see the whole, um, the whole ingredient list, but it didn't have any phosphate additives in it, no potassium additives. It's just a really, really good, uh, a, a great product. Um, Oh, I thought I had one other on here, but a note. Okay, so next one. So this, how do you find your can-have foods for your grocery list? Um, so again, this like knowing which foods you want to find in the grocery store is half the battle. When you go in, having that game plan can make it uh, less overwhelming with the hundreds of thousands of products that are in the grocery stores. So. Can have foods. Talk to your dietitians. Dietitians are great at being able to tell you what foods you can have. Um, if there's something you really miss in your diet, find a substitute. A lot of my patients, they really miss uh, uh, having like a pasta sauce, like a tomato sauce. So we'll talk about pesto or talk about using 
roasted red peppers instead and then where you would find them in the grocery store. Um, again, sticking with one grocery list is probably the number one best tip to just dispel confusion about what to eat. Just find your one grocery list. You can ask your dietitian for it, find it online from a reputable source, and stick with that one grocery list. Um, that helps you know which foods you can have. Great websites um, to look at, of course, kidney.org, National Kidney Foundation. They have um, ideas of different foods you can have. I put my own website on there because I think it's reputable. Kidneygrub.com. Kidney Chef is a new one that um, they have a really exciting concept coming out where you can put in your dietary parameters. It's run by a, a chef who actually has kidney disease and he has a fantastic board of professionals that have been working on this. Not fully launched, but you can go in there and kind of see their concept. It's all about meal planning, giving you a list from the get-go with great recipes. Really, really a neat concept. Um, and I'm excited for it to get to get finished off. Uh, Matan Volak is the, is the uh, chef that is the, um, the brain behind it, and he is just, he's fantastic. Um, finding some reputable cookbooks, uh, Davida has a lot. Cooking for David is one of my favorites. It's been around for forever. It was written by a patient's wife. Um, just so down to earth. Um, and then cut off a little bit at the bottom, but finding, uh, going on to patient support Facebook groups, um, that's another place where you can kind of glean a few tips here and there. Um, obviously, they're, they're not, people in those groups are not professionals. There might be some misinformation, but a lot of times there's great information. I know there's one on Facebook, the vegetarian, um, vegetarian diet and kidney disease group. Um, and these people that are on there, they love food and they love great food spices and they'll post recipes they've tried and show pictures and it's really fun to see how they make and restrictions that they have just seem like they're not restrictions anymore. They really find great ways around it. Um, so a couple other things that I love to make your foods livable and lovable. So splurge on spices. Find some great spices. I listed a few here. Even ordering them online is a great way to make your food delicious. There's a lot you can do in the spice section. Um, as long as it doesn't have added salt, it's pretty much free game. Um, infused oils are very, very popular. Uh, going on to the next slide right now. So that can be a fun way to cook. A, a uh, garlic infused oil really adds great flavor to food or an orange infused oil or truffle. Um, so those are some fun things that you can do to really expand your diet. Um, and then to finish up here, um, and uh, Christy, you'll have to tell me if this works, but I did put a little video, so you should be able to click it, and it will show you a fun uh, recipe that we did on our blog to just show you how much we love this livable, lovable, uh, kidney-friendly food. So let me know if that works for you guys, so I'm not quiet while it's going. I do believe it's playing. might not have any music, though. Oh, Okay. That's okay. I it's kind of <laughs> So this was, uh, I'll, I'll just do a voiceover then. This was a tomatillo salsa we made. Um, very few ingredients. It was a way for us to try using tomatillos in the grocery store, one of those less common foods that's kidney friendly. Um, it's so, so good on if you're making like a taco or an enchilada. Really great little recipe. Doesn't need any salt in it. Um, super, super simple. You cut them up, roast your tomatillos, put some lime in it. But when I talk about finding your list, finding some foods, and then just exploring them, I mean, the internet is, is a vast expanse of different ways that you can apply these food principles. Um, and we try and, try and do recipes like that. These movies are a new thing on the blog um, to kind of share some new ideas. Okay, and then has that finished up, Christy? Yep. Okay. So then very last, um, I just, um, I'd like to definitely take some questions about products or anything you have. If you are interested, you can find Kidney Grub all over the Internet. So Facebook, a Facebook group. So we sometimes will share things we find um, that we think are great on the Internet to so repost our own recipes, Twitter. 
Um, Instagram is a newer thing for us, but kind of fun to see the gallery of uh, beautiful foods that we cook. Uh, YouTube, like I said, we started doing food videos. Pinterest, I do several Pinterest boards um, on phosphate additives. I have some on breakfast, kidney-friendly breakfast. So if you go on Pinterest and just <laughs> search for kidney grub, then you will find um, all my boards on there where I, I try and pin great recipes I find. Um, so that can be a great uh, resource for you and hope that you'll head over there so you can use those as well. Um, but now I'll open it up for questions or uh, comments um, from anyone that um, has some thoughts. Um, I did get a question through the chat uh, that okay. is sort of related. I know you mentioned um, the infused cooking oils, but I do believe it's Patricia who asked, um, when it comes to cooking oils, what should you look for when thinking about kidney health? So that's a good question. Um, so with the cooking oils, um, as far as the kidneys themselves go, the type of oil is not as big of concern. When you're looking at heart health, which heart health and kidney health are, are very closely intertwined, then using an olive oil can be good. Using a canola oil can be good. There's a lot of debate right now about coconut oil. Um, so I generally, for a lot of the other oils, if you're rotating them, using them in moderation, then, then um, I think it's okay. A lot of people do great if they base their oil with olive oil. Um, that tends to be a, a really good one. If you're doing a lot of high heat cooking, you might want to use something like peanut oil that has a higher smoke point. Um, but uh, the other one I might mention, though, is walnut oil. If you get it from black walnuts, is a great anti-inflammatory uh, fat, um, and that can be a really a great oil to use as well. It's delicious and baked goods. A little bit pricey, but it is absolutely fantastic and baked goods. Um, the nuts that they come from doesn't, so if you see a walnut oil, you think, oh, walnuts, I can have those. They're high in phosphorus. The phosphorus doesn't transfer into the oil, and so you can use any type of nut oil that you want and be just fine. And actually, it was probably with that question, not Patricia. Sorry about that. She had a follow-up question asking if you know of any um, kidney healthy grocery lists that have an app version or something that's mobile friendly. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so there are several apps that are out there. I could, um, I don't have the links right off the top of my head. Uh, there's a really neat one that's coming out probably in the next year or so um, from Fork Friendly, ForkFriendly.com. And what they've done is they've gone through and they get the list of all those products, those 45,000 products I talked about. They get those every week and they have uh, students, nutrition students, that go in the grocery store and they look at the labels and then they identify foods with phosphates in them, sodium, whatever. And so this app will eventually come out so you can put in your dietary parameters, whether it's renal, cardiac, diabetes, and it will give you a list of, of the, the products, the actual specific products that would work best for you. That has not launched yet, um, but you could still check out some of their information. It's forkfriendly.com. Um, but I'm very, very excited for that to launch because I think it will be so useful. Um, and that Kidney Chef as well, it's not an app. Um, yep, I'm sure that will be coming down the pipeline, but kind of that same concept is what they're aiming for. I think National Kidney Foundation has one, but I, like, I, ha I haven't used it. So off the top of my head, I'm not, I don't know what the experience would be like interacting with it. Other questions? Looks like there might be another question coming through on the chat. Um, okay. Someone's typing right now. Oh, actually, um, John suggested another online source. Um, he suggested nutritiondata.self.com as a way to check nutrition information online. I do, I do like they'll have a phosphorus content on there, which can be useful if you're kind of peeking at a product. Um, also, chronometer is another one if you're looking at 
Uh, and they don't always have phosphorus on there, but uh, a lot of times they do for a lot of products. If you're trying to look up how much phosphorus or potassium it has in there, chronometer, and again, the self one um, that John mentioned, those are both good ones. My fitness pal doesn't mention phosphorus or potassium uh, a lot of times, at least in the app, the app part of it, so that the others will. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, I'd like to take just a moment to thank you very much, Jessiana, for sharing with us about the shopping at the grocery store and learning about labels and what to look for. Um, very much appreciated, and I encourage everyone on the call to go visit uh, kidneygrub.com. Uh, I also want to just uh, remind everybody as you sign off, you'll be able to um, give us some feedback and some ideas on other topics you'd like to see. And I also want to remind you that on November 16th, we will have our next webinar, and that will be on Fibre disease. Again, thanks. I want to thank all of you for attending today's session, and it will be recorded so that you or um, others that you know can also view it at a later date. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was nice talking with all of you, and you can always reach out to me through the blog as well. I have my uh, contact information on there. Great. Thank you again. All right. Bye.